of this idea. I, I title, I want to title this, The Art of Self-Sacrifice. In the beginning of this parashat, parashat, parashat uh, we see Avraham sitting in a tent. And we all know what happens in this story. He's there sitting, recuperating from his self-prescribed circumcision in the plane of memory. And uh, there uh, he is in the heat of the day waiting for visitors to possibly come. So in the midst of his pain, he's waiting to be a host, to be hospitable to someone. And in this time, Hashem pays him a visit, an amazing visit in which he there sits in the heat of the day and Hashem comes to console him. And we're going to see different a aspects of Avraham Avinu that I would challenge us all and every one of us in this room as well as those who will watch this lecture. Every one of us will, will be able to immediately begin to implement these things to be like Abraham and, and focus on them because they tend to be, even though they're the most, probably the easiest things to focus on, tend to be sometimes the most ign ignored things. Abraham is there sitting and in that time three men came. It says, according to Midrash, that Abraham considered them men, not because he assumed they were men, but he had so used to see, seeing angels that he just, he greeted them as if they were men. Now, one way or another, we know that he greets them, entertains them, he brings them um, food to eat. During this, this uh, highly, uh, what do you call it, traditional sort of greeting of bowing and greeting a stranger and bringing them in and and he says, you know, let me bring up a few morsels of bread. And instead he lays out a wonderful feast. And he, he not only is he entertained or entertains the angels, but at the same time uh, uh, beseeches the very presence of God to intercede on behalf of the people of, of, of Saddam. And Sodom and Gomorrah was about ready to be destroyed, the creator through the angels, decided to share this idea with them. And Abraham began to make an appeal on behalf of the innocent. It wasn't an appeal on behalf of the wicked. I mean, the wicked needed to be destroyed, but why would Hashem, and this was his argument, why would you destroy the innocent animals and humans uh, while trying to destroy the others? And so they end up negotiating for uh, a settlement which ended up just was about getting Lot and his family out of the city. And in saying all of that, we come to the next part where Abraham is going to bring his son Isaac, and he's going to put him on an altar with wood to present him as a sacrifice. This is the ultimate form of self-sacrifice, the ultimate level. Uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know, I'm sure there are people listening who have sent sons and daughters to war and some of them didn't come home. They came home under the draped flag and a coffin of their country. And in doing so, those parents sacrificed so much and never in their wildest dreams when that child was born would have thought that that child was to be uh, sacrificed on an altar of freedom. And yet Abraham is told by the creator of the universe to take the boy, which he was now about 37 years old, and bring him to the mountain there for the sacrifice. The servants asked him, where is the, you know, wh where's the sacrifice? Our son asked, where's the sacrifice? And he said that Hashem would provide it. Abraham comes from a culture of, of, um, of idolatry and human sacrifice. Hashem was wanting to test him on the aspect of his absolute ability to sacrifice all of his desires and will to Hashem, and obviously passed with living color. What am I, what am I getting to today? And it is this. 
many of those who come out of, of their former lifestyle to embrace, embrace Torah Judaism want to grasp a hold of the high ideals of mitzvah, right? You want to eat kosher and you want to have a kosher home and you, you want to dress kosher and holy and modest. You want to do all those things. At the same time, we forget the very essence and the essential part of what made and separated Avraham from all the people of his society was his, his, his ability to sacrifice self for others. Last week's part showed what happens. He takes his army of 300-something people and defeats four other kingdoms. Incredible. He could have easily said, this is not my battle. He could have easily said, you guys fight your own battle. Instead, he gathered up his army and fought this heroic battle. Then when he comes back and he brings an offering, brings the tithe to uh, Melech Tzadik, what does he tell him? I, I don't even want a shoestring from you. Right? You see the sense of, of humility and the sense of bearing, the sense of, no, it's about service to others above myself. And we're living in such a self-centered culture today that people, it, it's almost mind-boggling for most people in postmodern America to ever think of others above themselves. Uh, prime example, you can go uh, anywhere. As a matter of fact, Adam and I were talking about this uh, earlier this week, about how you'll go to like some kind of a social event, and people will, you know, that are in line, never think about people at the end of the line Who's not going to be able to get food if they pig out and, you know, get them big piles of food? They're just not in the mode of thinking of other people. They don't think about it. We live in a society in which, obviously, we had to have a disaster to sort of test the mettle of our community. And I was pretty impressed by our community of people who sacrificed themselves for others. But you see, this attitude has to be so fundamental that we don't even think twice about it. It's so fundamental that when we look at something, for example, and I know this sounds like, okay, now you're asking way too much. But when you're, when you're uh, in a place, we have to be situationally aware all the time of what are we doing to sacrifice for other people. And we're not talking about flaying ourselves and beating ourselves up. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about preferring others above ourselves. That is an attitude that Avraham Avinu had that many people have lost in all these centuries. The attitude that says, ah, you know what, I, I know that, that, uh, that I, I, you know, I've told you my, my uh, demons when it comes to driving, right? Because I get annoyed at people who take up the road and drive on the wrong side of the road, drive slow in the fast lane, you know those things. The reason why it annoys me is because I'm very situationally aware and I try to be courteous. Like if I see somebody coming up behind me and I happen to be in that lane passing a car, I'll speed up to get around them so that car can go ahead. I'm always thinking about other people. At the same time, this becomes fundamental to who we are. Be why? Because we've discovered the creator of the universe is a giver. Right? Now we are vessels and we receive. But at the same time, do you realize that our ability to receive is equal to measure for measure for what we give out? You cannot receive more in your vessel if your vessel's full of you and full of your own desires and full of your own methods and, and mechanisms. And thank God he's never asked us to give a son or a daughter. Baruch Hashem. At the same time, Abraham trusted the creator of the universe and not only that but you'll remember the text and we'll discuss this in the deep uh, discussion in a minute when Abraham and, and Isaac went up he told the servants that we are going what together well, the sages of blessed memory say that what that really meant was that both of them were in one mind about what they were getting ready to do it's incredible 37 years old he could have probably overpowered his father but yet he was in one mind with his father. He's like, if this is what the Creator wants, then we're going to do this together. I'm not sure how it's going to happen. But Abraham had such complete, pure faith that he says, we will go up and sacrifice and we will, what? Return. The reason why the world we live in tends to be so self-centered 
and self-promoting is because they do not believe that there is a force and a creator outside of themselves that is the sustainer of everything that they are and have. You see, we are fundamentally different from those people because we truly believe that our source isn't our job. Our source isn't uh, our, our methods. Our source belongs to the creator of the universe who we realize that he gives us the power to do these things. He, he gives us the ability to be able to expend ourselves and yet reward us at the same time. So, what am I going to do about this knowledge of Abraham Avinu? I don't expect any of us to go leave our mothers and fathers and go out in the wilderness somewhere and try to get a cult together. What we're talking about is something very simple. Number one, it is important to remember to visit the sick. Now, see, you thought this was going to be complicated. This is so stupidly simple that it's, it, it, we, should be, we should leave this place going, talk on it. We get so focused on the big stuff, we forget the most important stuff. The creator of the universe gives us this lesson in this parashat, parashat, parashat and he's, it is about visiting the sick, highlighting since the Lord himself appeared into Abraham while he was recuperating from his circumcision. The healing value of such a visitation is powerful. Now, I have, uh, I have people that I know that I wouldn't visit in the hospital. Do you know why? Because they don't want any visits when they're sick, Right? However, text and Facebook messages and say, hey, just check in and makes them feel extremely wonderful. But hospital visits, there's a power in the healing of visiting other people. Next, the requirement to be hospitable. Not hostile, hostile, but hospitable. That means that the, the greater, this is, and this is one of the amazing things we find in the text. It is deemed greater than standing in the presence of Hashem. According to the ba uh, Babylonian Talmud, Shabbat 127a, it says, For Abraham left God to greet the strangers. In the Talmudic comment, it says, Or is God really more impressed, uh, God is more impressed about how we treat our fellows than anything in the world. And we talk about how great our religious devotion and study Torah, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but if we don't have time to be hospitable toward other people, then we're really missing the game. Next, I love this. Say little and do a lot. Do much. Right? You know, people always talking about, oh, I do this and this to help this person, that program, and this and that. Just keep your mouth shut and do it. Abraham says, oh, come in. I get a little, little bit of uh, bread and some meat for you guys. Sit down. Be and he brings a feast, man. And he's running all over the place making sure this stuff gets done. And this was a guy who had a fresh, fresh surgery, right? This wasn't easy. Maybe the healing had already taken place. It says one of the angels came to heal him as well. It says in Baba Metzra uh, 87a, it says, For Abraham said that he would uh, merely fresh, fe fetch a morsel of bread, yet he brought his guest a sumptuous meal. Should this lesson be forcefully imparted upon political leaders? How do you explain the human tendency to actually do less than we promise to do? Politicians are great about bloviating about all the stuff they'll do, and they just don't do it. And they know, you know, they are not going to do it. But they just do it anyway. Salespeople, yeah. How, this is the one best technique on a salesperson. Guy tried to do this to me the other day. He said, if you'll sign today, I'll throw in this. And I said, okay, thanks, appreciate that. But I'm not going to tell you today. I'm going to wait till I talk to my wife. She's the boss. And he said, well, if you, I'm telling you, I, I tell you what, if you sign today, I'll throw in not only this, but this. And I'm like, look, first of all, you should have offered that up front. Second of all, I told you I'm not going to tell you anything until later on. It's like people want to throw in all these promises. Last but not least, it is necessary to be concerned about proper etiquette. As godly people, we should be focused on proper etiquette. Now think of a few things that are proper etiquette that stands out above the world around us. Say it again. Standing, yes, yeah, standing when a chacham comes through the door. One of the rabbis that comes to teach, we stand. That should be like without a thought. We just stand. 
You know, in the South, we still say yes, sir, and no, sir. Yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. Some people are offended by it. But it's a local etiquette that it's a good tradition to have. Uh, the next thing, how about uh, considering others uh, when you're having conversation? Not to be the one always dominating the conversation about how great you are. To actually listen to someone and say, well, how was this and that? Have you ever had someone that you knew that, that would never ask you how your family's doing? Not even interested. They don't even, they don't even pretend. They don't even take a moment to say, how, how are your sons doing? How's your daughter doing? Now, a person with, with great etiquette is somebody who remembers. Rabbi uh, Zalman Weiss, when I saw him in the park, uh, we only had 15 minutes maybe, right, at Jesse Jones Park. And I'm trying to get out like, okay, how's your wife? How's your kids? And he's busy going, how's your daughter? How's your kids? All right? And we're trying to, you know, one-up each other because you want to show someone that you're really concerned about where they're at. And then we got off on trying to get his daughter married, and I told her I had a 700-pound kosher guy that works at my PETA. It's a great cook. So she was not interested for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> but no, etiquette, proper etiquette. Letting people know that that's what sets us above everybody else. Last thing in this short. Rabbi Chaim, Moshe Chaim Lozato helps us to understand that we really can never show holiness to the creator of the universe. It only... It, it, it can only be demonstrated through our holiness toward each other, how we treat each other. What set Abraham aside was not the size of his tefillin. What set Abraham made him Ivrit, a one who crossed over, he's went to the other side, he's left everybody behind him, was the fact that it was a man of intense character and, uh, and proper attitude toward Hashem and also attitude toward his people. A, a, a great loyalty to those people who are loyal to the Creator. It wasn't the size of, quote-unquote, his tzitzit. It was the size of his heart that made him different. And may Hashem truly help to distinguish, especially the righteous of the nation, who generally don't have a lot of things that separate them, right? When I say things like colors of clothes and uniforms, etc., but what sets them aside and different, what makes us different, is the very fact that we don't march to the same self-centered, egotistical drum that the rest of the world marches to. And Baruch Hashem, what gives us this great uh, knowledge is the Torah. And that concludes this shiur. Amen.